name's Tony Lott. I'm the general manager of Fred Bean's Kia and Langhorn. I just wanted to take a minute to talk about Larry Feldman, Career Changers USA. Larry and I have been working together for about the last 12 years now. And anything I've ever needed as far as recruiting, training, Larry has been right there. Um, Larry's got me salespeople. He's got me managers. He's got me technicians even through the toughest times in the industry. And he is just the kind of guy who's going to tell you exactly what's on his mind. He's going to tell you exactly what he thinks. But Larry also has the expertise to back it up. When he was in the dealership world, he was a top performer. And that's really important to my staff, uh, especially as it pertains to training. A lot of people can come in and teach out of a textbook, but Larry has real world experience dealing with customers, dealing with situations and dealerships that we go through on a daily basis and try to train on. But Larry's been through it, so he can really empathize with the people and tell you what's worked for him and maybe what way not to go. Um, Larry is just always at a 10. I mean, his energy level is always up there. And I think people, they just love that and they feed off of it. Um, he's not faking it. He, he is genuinely excited to come in and help you. He's excited to come in and help grow your business. And he's one of those people who just really enjoys seeing dealers succeed and um, have a lot of fun at the same time. All right. Life is about connection. Having a support system to lean on. And roads to endless possibility. At every turn, guiding the way, we are building the connections that move you. So what would your dealership feel like if your entire sales staff was literally on fire, your sales and service staff, they were nonstop all over social media, completely dominating your marketplace. They could do it in 30 days or less and then continue their education to do it for an entire six months or a year. You literally would completely take over the entire marketplace and no one would be able to compete with you. And that's what we can do for you. So when you're walking around your community, whether you're at local restaurants or you're going to the gym if you don't want to be bothered fine you won't be bothered but a lot of people will walk up to you and say oh my god I love your social media your staff is amazing we love what you're doing in the community we want to come buy a car from you we want to get an oil change at your dealership your community is absolutely gonna love you and it doesn't matter what platform you're on you could be on TikTok, LinkedIn Facebook Instagram all social media platforms you will literally be all over the place and not only will you have access Ads running, but your own staff is going to be promoting your brand and promoting themselves within the dealership and within the business. So it's like running an ad times a hundred fold because your entire staff is participating in the process. I've traveled all over North America. I've trained Toyota. I've trained Nissan. I've been to driving sales. I've been to women in auto. I get hired as a speaker for conferences at universities all over the country. And I can help change the trajectory of your dealership right now hey if you miss us live you can you can listen to us wherever you get your podcast hello this is ian from the auto hub show and i'm here with elena is that how you pronounce it elena all right and she is the expert on all things ev i believe well depends on who you're talking to yeah yeah <laughs> well it's funny we did a video on the lucid air a year ago we went to the studio and we actually Got a test drive and I made the mistake of shooting the test drive, which I would never do again from the passenger seat. Don't do that. Get yourself a GoPro, do it right. Anyway, uh, but I also, we just put up an interview with a lady who's a automotive influencer from Monaco. So it's kind of interesting interview. I had to cut it down from two hours of raw footage to I think 40 minutes. So it was kind of an interesting interview, but also we have a regular on our show who writes for the Golden Mail. She's an auto reviewer. Uh, and she gets to travel over the world reviewing cars, but also wanted to do a review of VinFast, but only recently were you actually able to drive these cars. Right. And I talked to a gentleman here at the show and he said, yeah, I want to get a dealer's license. I didn't realize they were doing dealer's license. I thought that their own thing. But what's your feeling on 
EVs these days, but specifically on the used side, because I think that's a very affordable way to buy EVs. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, the, the used prices that we're seeing now on EVs is, is just is, is incredible. And it's a way to, um, as I was doing in my, my last interview, and oh, by the way, I have a show called EVs for Everyone podcast. So that's how, I, <laughs> how I'm able to, you know, kind of curate this really diverse um you know, the sea of people in the industry who are able, you know, to talk about EVs. And so uh, what I've just been hearing on also the, the dealer side is like, man, especially with some of the tax credits and now the point of sale tax credit uh, coming in on the on the used car side is really helping people to just be able to experience these cars for the first time. And um, it's really interesting to see some of the dealers who are utilizing some of those things, um, you know, who may or may not be like, yay, EVs, right? Because there's there's a little bit of a push and pull there now. And that's saying it nicely, right? It's to, to say that there's um, uh, not everybody is uh, drinking the Kool-Aid as, as it were. So um, used EVs right now are, um, are, it's volatile, it's, but it's not going away. Right. So I also did an interview with um, Amira Ali. She is a uh, auto finance expert and she was a former Tesla and uh, Lucid employee. She uh, worked at Chase Automotive, like did all of these amazing things in uh, auto finance. And she was saying, like, look, like that, that these glut of off lease vehicles are coming back into the (laughs) into the market. Right. And it's like, you know, and, and we talked about the fact that, like, lenders are not totally loving EVs, you know, because you have to, you have the, the rate, the credit risk and this, you know, so there's so many different parts of this equation. And what I find to be like super, super fascinating about this is, is like, it is, um, no matter how you feel about EVs, it's something that you have to contend with. Yeah. Something that you have to just say like, all right, what is my, what is my view on this? What is my strategy, especially if you're on the retail side, especially if you're, you know, you're uh, customer facing and you got to move the Maki and you got to move the, uh, was it G4 by E, right? You know, you got to move these vehicles. So what, it, what are you doing to facilitate that? Yeah, I mean, I, I remember way back when General Motors made some mistakes on lease end values. And I remember when they first started leasing, I think it was Model 3s, I was at a Tesla store where I used to live, which is Vancouver, uh, which is a big market for them. And I was trying to get basic answers about their leasing from a salesperson. Mm. And I said, okay, so it's a forced return lease, but you don't know the lease end value. You don't know the carrying cost, but people just buy it because it's a Tesla. He said, yeah. I said, so probably that means the lease end value is really high. And probably that also means there's going to be, I don't know, a couple of thousand of these landing a month when people go, yeah, yeah, here you go. Good luck. Right. Um, right. And with the resale value the way it is already, I think it's going to be a huge opportunity for consumers who maybe want to get into EV to get it into it um, affordably. But the yeah. bigger question, and I don't know, Brent cv has been on our show many times, is, you know, not only how do you finance that car, mm. Number two, you know, how do you evaluate it from a battery perspective? Yeah. And yeah. what's the replacement cost of that battery? And can you get a warranty? Yeah, no, there's a lot of, well, there's a lot of really cool companies out there that are solving for that, you know, that particular problem, um, most of which have been on my show. But <laughs> but, there, but there, there are folks out there making sure that, look, this, this used EV ecosystem is vast and it's going to have whole lot of different tentacles to it. So I think, um, you know, what's what's really going to be interesting is how some of these technologies are thoughtfully br- being brought to market. And what's, again, we're at a SoduCon, right? And the whole thing with a SoduCon is like collaboration and conversations. Right. Do not build your product in a silo. Like, go and have conversations with your target audience, your target customer, like, you know, if you're, uh, you know, you, you're in the used EV tech space, like go and talk to some auctions, go and talk to some, you know what I mean? Like have those open dialogues because nobody creates anything worthwhile in a, in this bubble, like 
you have to be able to collaborate and, and partner with people. So I'll leave it at that. You know, there are people working on solutions and um, for, you know, a variety of, of things, you know, battery health to the recycling of the battery. Right. And what does that look like? And uh, warranty, it, 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 it runs the gamut, it really does. Yeah, I mean, there was uh, um, a gentleman or a company at SEMA this year. I was at SEMA and they were selling, I think they're California based. They have about 100 and 50,000 square foot of EV space at SEMA every year. And there were some interesting conversion cars, including an original Golan, which I was kind of doing a double take on just because of the cost <laughs> of those things. Anyway, but uh, they were talking about just coverage completely, much like when I worked for Safeguard Corporation and Nissan, where they sold a bunch of warranty products. But the thing that is interesting, strictly from a valuation point of view, and I, we've had many people on the show talk about that, I think the battery's worth about 40% of the actual value. Mm -hmm. Um, so when you're looking at selling used EVs, and I know this is going to happen because I'm sure people sell them and didn't know what they were selling, um, you know, what happens when that battery dies uh, three months after they buy it? Uh, and there was even a case, I think it was Hyundai, not to beat them up, but I think it was, where someone had bought a used car, mm. it was a used Hyundai electric of some type, the battery packed it in. Yeah. A couple weeks before it did, he took it to the dealer going, yeah, I just want this checked. So they checked it and it was fine. And then he took it back and they were willing to give him 500 bucks for a car with no battery. Then he went to the media, of course, and they, then they tried to sort of make it right. But this was the second car that he bought that was electric. It just happened to be a used one. Oh, so yeah. it was kind of interesting as yeah. the OEMs adapt, but more importantly, consumers adapt because of fuel costs. I mean, I happen to reside in a country where in some provinces it's 12 bucks a gallon. So these days. So yeah, there's a, there's definitely a demand, but the question is, you know, price benefit. Also. Yeah. Price benefit. And, uh, you know, to, to your point about like what the, the battery, like that, that is, that's, that's the kit and caboodle. That's really the heart of, of these vehicles. So I think, you know, we're, we're definitely going to see a lot more of these, uh, these companies like trying to make sense of what that looks like and um you know having really really smart like phd level <laughs> people looking at this this battery chemistry so um but i i think at the same time i think it's also kind of giving the auto industry a moment to like give pause to the fact that like this is the future of kind of like where we're going right and I, I think we all need to kind of not not get on board like people are entitled to their own opinions and and this and that but I, I think as an industry if we can foster more of these open dialogues and you know what what the finance company is doing and what the you know the, the dealer is doing what the OEM is doing and you know I just finished recording an episode uh michael wood from uh checkered flag gm right. and he was like yeah i really wish the the oems would help us a little bit more on the um uh, the visibility side of some of more of the positive press about ev right we see all the time we got a lot of like negative things happening because right. they sure do right negative things happen we're in the real world but maybe if there's if there's uh, something that we can like maybe hang our hat on a little bit more of like, this is the fact of this specific make and model. These are the facts on this. And so it's um, more of a balanced approach. And I think that's really smart actually, because I haven't really to date seen anything, right? You know, you see like mostly the brand awareness that, that folks are, are uh, kind of leaning on is like, you know, uh, was it Pharrell Williams yeah. driving the Cybertruck, right? So they're, right, so they're, you're getting brand awareness for, for Tesla, but what, what brand awareness, you know, on, on some of the, the content do you have for maybe perhaps an ID4 or um, I, I know I keep referencing that Jeep. I don't know why I have that, that Jeep floor by E on my brain. Why? Maybe, maybe you're a Jeep customer. Maybe you're a Jeep customer. I don't even have one. Like, I don't even have a Jeep. I don't know why that, like. No, no endorsement required. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, all I know is they, they need to move these vehicles, right? So it's like, what are the, the creative ways? Because I, you know, like you, Ian, you're a content creator. I'm a content creator. So um, I'm interested in that also side of the coin 
Well, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I, I used to live in Vancouver, which is a big uh, electric car market, very large market, um, just because of climate and everything else. I moved to Alberta recently, which is not an EV market because of climate. Uh, the dealers are challenged because of just temperature, uh, but also because it's a big oil and gas uh, province, which is basically like a state in the US. There's a lot of hatred towards these vehicles for whatever reason. But the thing that's really interesting is when you look at dealers that are saying, hey, we still got to sell these things. Uh, I know some of them personally. The challenge they have is trying to convince that person to even look at it. And I remember years ago when I sold cars, I sold a lot of hybrid cars. Actually, was probably the most successful hybrid salesman at the dealership I worked at. And the reason is I had the conversation, I wasn't afraid of it. A lot of sales are like, oh, you want to buy a hybrid? Oh, yeah, I don't know anything about that. Talk to that guy. And I remember going back there years later, and I was actually in the showroom, and a customer came in and said, yeah, well, I'm looking at a hybrid. I go, oh, we used to have a guy here who, who sold those. He's not here anymore, but good luck with that. Right. And that was kind of their stick. And it was kind of interesting because fast forward, 15 years, when you look at EVs, and I think hybrids will be part of that solution. Toyota's proving it, obviously. Uh, but, you know, it's going to be a transition. Uh, and when you look at EVs specifically, when you have companies like VinFast, who's trying to adjust to North America, and then you have, obviously, the, the, the specter of BYD coming. Uh, I was actually just talking to, to, to uh, about uh, tariffs. Because uh, the, the leader of our country is not commenting, even though he just spent a bunch of money with Honda. Um, but, you know, the, the question there becomes, if you had a vehicle that was, say, $20,000, uh, whether that was made here or made somewhere else, is that going to change the channel in terms of adoption? I don't know. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see. And VinFast, with their model in Asia, which was lease the battery, buy the car, isn't really translating here, but it's an interesting model. So what do you think the, the future is gonna be for say, entry level EVs? I mean, where do you see that? I mean, entry level EV, I think, and I've, I've talked about this on my show a couple of times, I think that is really going to be um, in the financial mechanism and enabling people that are uh, entry level workers as well. Like we're talking about moving from a high end, luxury product because when Tesla first came on the scene that's what it was seen as right since then they've kind of morphed into something that's maybe well automotive news says that they're not no longer to, uh, luxury JD power disagrees anyway so that's a whole other like kind of back and forth but so we're going from this high-end luxury to now like okay we ran out of the early adopters now it's like everyone else mainstream right and then so i think it's really smart some of these new this, um, financial mechanisms like a micro lease and i know people like have this bad taste in their mouth from the oem subscription programs because they were kind of a hot mess and disaster but if you do it right and you actually can empower a dealer to use a micro lease as a way to get uh you know People that look, they need to. They need to a commuter car to get to and from the the Amazon warehouse, or they need to get to it. You know, they maybe work in that uh, less than fifty mile radius from their home. But then also, let's talk about using it as a mechanism to be a mobility partner in their community, to be able to have these people to have upward trajectory and career advancement like an EV can easily fit into the equation in that way um, so I think some of those more creative solutions are I think are gonna rise to the top especially now when people are like I, I don't know what to, to, to do with this with this payment right is this payment is just insane so <laughs> Well, it's interesting you bring that up because leasing is obviously a part of what I did when I worked for Honda. Uh, I've seen a lot of movement now from Honda and other brands to say, okay, we have a certified use program. Okay. Can we have a certified use lease program? Because they're worried about obviously the cost of, of vehicles, the interest rates, um, the overall cost factor. Um, you know, brands like BMW going, ah, where did my three series people go? Um, you know, and I remember years ago having a discussion with the largest BMW dealer in, in Canada about this thing. I said, if you think those three series customers aren't buying Model 3s, you're not paying attention. You need to study that car. You need to train your people. But more importantly, as they and, and Volkswagen and others have gotten electric, how are they making that affordable 
uh, maybe in a shorter term lease, maybe in a shorter mileage lease, maybe to your point in a, I can change my vehicle lease. Uh, and then when you see brands like Porsche, for example, going, uh, and I just read an article yesterday, they have a hybrid 911, mm. which they're not talking much about, but supposedly it's faster than their gas one. Mm. So they're trying to dip their toe in that water. McCann, okay, great, electric, but 911, I don't know. We're not sure, we're not sure we want to piss off everybody. No, Simultaneously. No, no. Yeah, so I thought that no. was interesting. Yeah, so. I think you want to just kind of like leave that 911 alone. Like it just is like, yeah, you can just, you know, you have, but I, I think- well, They said it's faster than GT3, the hybrid one. Oh my gosh. So that's going to cause all kinds of other issues, which is interesting. <laughs> so many like raised eyebrows at the same time. <laughs> I bought a GT3 last year. Oh, this thing's quicker. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, I, th I think the, uh, the other part of it too is like not, not talking about the, the luxury brands, but like the Ford, the GM yeah. and like Stellantis, like <laughs> they definitely need like some sort of a, uh, a mechanism to get people, um, in, in that have a use case. And I want to just bring use case into it just a little bit because, you know, yes, EVs are, we've got challenges with infrastructure. Like yeah. every, everyone knows this, this is, this is not a mystery. So, you know, when you have someone that maybe, again, I use the example of in that 50 mile radius, Kent just needs it for that, that commuting type of, type of a vehicle and then how do you pair that up with potentially the employer and then employee retention um you know drive it away is a company that does that they they enable like that type of uh, micro lease into the into a, uh, a staffing agency and just say like this is a way that you're gonna be able to you can charge your vehicle at the at the plant that you're going to or charge your vehicle at the office location that you're going to go work you know you're you're there for seven eight hours right <laughs> hopefully so hopefully unless you're you know like I, i'm leaving it's it's friday i gotta leave it's three o'clock i'm out i'm out so but i think that's that's a different way to start to think about hey this can fit into my lifestyle because the use case is there so again, it, it's, it's about tailoring to what is the segment of the population that the group of people that could be like, yeah, I can see this as my car. Well, also, I mean, if you're looking at a, uh, an office environment, I know we have different generations saying, hey, you know, I'm not motivated the same way. What if it was a perk or a shared perk even for say an urban office, for example? I mean, that's, that's an amazing perk to go from, I need to go and wait at the bus stop because I don't have a car to, I, I have a car now. You better believe I'm going to work really hard at this job and, and do it at, to the best of my ability and potentially like learn and grow. What, what's, what's the biggest problem now that, that staffing has, right? Where they're like, I employee retention. Yep. And then it's like, so there's- In the auto industry? <laughs> oh that was that was a bird that was a bird oh ian ian was coming in hot on that one um yeah but i i think in a lot of ways it just it checks a lot of boxes it makes sense and so to be continued right it's I, oh absolutely I, I say i say this all the time like we're on chapter five of like 500 like this is a very long 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 novel and we need to just understand that you know it, it, it's it's taking time and, and baby steps but um in the meantime we'll have good conversations right yeah, I mean, we had an interview, uh, what was it, two years ago with Ben Stock. We were doing OEMs versus the dealer. Yeah. And he couldn't be on the show because he was meeting with the OEM. No, no names mentioned. <laughs> uh, and uh, he said, hey, electric cars are great, but where are you going to charge in New York? I'd have to sell them with the extension cord. And we were talking a little bit about fuel injection and airbags. He says he didn't go to 100% fuel injection back in the day. He didn't go to 8, 12 airbags back in the day. He did a percentage. And it's funny because lately he's been promoting the new Acura. I think it's a prologue or the uh, the Honda prologue and he was you know doing videos of him driving it but the thing that was interesting when you look at uh brands that maybe haven't been in that uh yet or at least haven't dipped their toe in and Honda being one of them I think there was a recent investment of 15 billion 
in Canada to build production facility, um, mostly government funded, I'm sure. But at the end of the day, it's a, it's a investment in infrastructure to build. But the bigger question, this is something that I think I've been thinking about for a long time. I've even done the math on it. Even if it's only 20%, uh, which I think is a reasonable five-year plan, not 100%, which I think is a delusional plan, even that is a, is a step in the right direction. I mean, when I, when I was looking at hybrid vehicles and selling hybrid vehicles, they might have been 10%. Yes. And this wasn't that long ago. Was, I mean, now they're probably 40%, but that was 15 years ago. So it takes time. But I agree with you there. Any final thoughts? Uh, final thought and takeaway is to be open-minded. I think a lot of times we get in, in our own, we get in our own way a lot of times and be open to having conversations, be open to having conversations with Ian because he's super smart, but you know what I mean? Like have, have the self-awareness maybe to be like, you know what? Let me learn more about whatever the case may be, whatever it is. Let me learn more of it and, and actually like take the time to study it because there, like I said, there are a whole lot of smart people working on this, pro this problem. Like we sent people to the moon, like we can figure out EVs. Like I'm, I'm pretty confident we can like figure it out, figure this out. So have an open mind. Yeah. And also don't be afraid of it. I mean, when I sold vehicles and I was selling hybrids and I was the number one selling hybrid guy in the building, in a lot of cases, I didn't sell hybrid because I basically sat down with the person and said, okay, what are you doing with the car? Not that you shouldn't buy it. And at that time, I think some of them were five to seven grand more than a gas car, shockingly. Um, and, 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 the, and the salesman I work with are always like, well, I'm surprised that that person didn't buy a hybrid. Well, did you take the time to ask him some questions? No. You might have wanted to do that. Not saying they shouldn't buy a hybrid. It's fine. It doesn't matter to me. But, you know, you've got to take the time. And I think the same is true with electric. It may not be the answer for what you're doing. If you're driving 300 miles a day all the time, that may not be the car for you. But if you're driving 30 to 50, it might be, right? Exactly. Exactly. And to, I, would, I would love an ideal scenario where at, you know, every real t retail location, people are like educated and excited about different options in the vehicle spectrum. We're not there yet. You know, I talked to dealers about, I talked to two really awesome dealers today about it today. And they're like, we're not there yet, but we're working on it. So, um, you know, I, it's, it's, it takes time. Yeah. I mean, not everyone needs a V12, but probably not a lot of people need a V8 or a V6. But then, of course, you know, there is that juice that's supposedly good. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks very much. Thank you, Ian. Hey, if you miss us live, you can, you can listen to us wherever you get your podcast.